In today's episode, we go back to a case from 1994, a missing dealer. It would start a murder investigation without a body being found. Police would uncover a dark criminal underworld, a charismatic hitman, and how a victim was buried in a concrete coffin, and then dug up and moved three times. Danny Dyke was a physio for rugby clubs, a very well paid job. He came from a well off background, socialised with rugby and sports players. He was very successful. But Danny led a double life. Danny was a dealer and was buying wholesale quantities of Class A and B product from criminal gangs in London and supplying them to dealers in Wales. Danny's sideline enterprise soon became his main job and being a physio, become part-time and a cover. Danny was shipping significant quantities of controlled product and return with large amounts of cash. With the money rolling in, he made frequent trips back and forth between the southeast of England and Swansea in his distinctive red Ford Escort RS Turbo. One of the dealers in Wales Danny was supplying to was John Jackie Wellesby. Jackie being his nickname. Wellesby had his own building company, JKW Builders, and just finished a sentence for dishonesty. While in prison, Wellesby decided to enter the drug game and put his time behind bars to get as much info and contacts he could. He never wasted a day. As soon as Wellesby was released, he entered the world of drug dealing and started making large sums fast with his new contacts. He started off as a runner and then moved into dealing himself. He was introduced to Danny through a contact who dealt with bodybuilders at a local gym. After chatting to Danny, they hit it off immediately and Wellesby started ordering large amounts of weed and the strong variety skunk, which was dealt throughout Wales. Danny sold Wellesby £30,000 of product and Wellesby managed to shift it within the day. Danny was impressed and Wellesby had a great choice of products at a nice price from someone he could trust. Wellesby would meet out of town at supermarkets and retail parks and at service stations and would make the swap with Danny for cash for the product. Danny would make regular visits and Wellesby shifted it so quick that he was back on the phone wanting to buy more and large quantities off Danny. There's a saying my mum used to tell me all the time. I later found out it was from William Shakespeare. Neither a lender or a borrower be. A line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Now Danny, for some reason, I can't get my head round if it was greed or trust although he had a London firm behind it. He had given Wellesby £24,000 worth of drugs. And this was agreed to be paid later. Danny drove to see Wellesby at his father's house. Wellesby wasn't there, but a package was left for Danny and it contained £16,000. Danny put the money under the seat of his Ford RS Turbo. He then drove to Port Talbot to meet an associate at Wellesby, a bouncer, and a taxi driver, a fellow drug peddler named John Wilson. At the house it's not known if he was lured there or if threats were made. At the house with John Wilson was Wellesby in the kitchen. Whatever happened over the next few minutes, it resulted in Danny being brutally and mercilessly beaten to death. Wellesby and Wilson then rolled the body in a carpet and threw it in the back of a builder's van. Wearing gloves and disposable overalls, Danny's red escort RS Turbo was driven to Brecon. They removed the money, his belongings, and dumped the car by a nature trail. Wellesby and Wilson cleaned the house and ripped out all the kitchen. They ripped up the flooring, the cupboards, the two kitchen doors were removed. Danny's body was then taken to land owned by Wellesby, where he kept his building equipment. He moved one of the sheds and dug a hole, and buried Danny, and moved the shed back over the body. 
few days later, Danny's body was dug up and reburied in a shallow grave. Whilst we put over ash left from bonfires to disguise the smell. And that was the end of that. A drug dealer goes missing. No body, no crime. What John Walsby didn't count on was the London firm Danny bought from. Danny was extremely well liked and trustworthy and for him not to report in for several days started to raise concerns. Plus he did owe the firm a considerable amount of money. When Danny's mother had not heard from her son, worried she started phoning his friends, who some were part of the London firm. The mob realised that Danny was in trouble. Most likely he's been robbed and killed. After a meeting, the firm started to begin their own investigation with their very own hitman. Now this hitman wasn't some shoot up the joint kind of muscle bound nutter. From his description, the hitman, he was in his late 40s, dressed in country suits, worked on his own most of the time. He never used guns unless ordered to, so he never carried one. He was extremely polite and friendly. Even when this hitman is threatened, which happened quite a few times, he remains calm. And this line he uses that was reported to police, I thought was amazing. When told by a dealer who was questioning, the dealer said, I don't know anything, now do one. The hitman's reply, that's okay. We still have plenty of time. I'll let you think about it. And then he doesn't leave. It shows to who he's with, have a think about your situation. I'm not going to hurt you, yet, but I'm not letting it go either. In most cases, people give up the information there and then, and even end up thanking him and shaking his hand. This hitman was sent out to go through and find Danny's contacts, find out who killed him, kill them, and send a message. Danny's mother in the meantime was worried sick and phoned the police. A description of his movements and his car was given. As police investigated further, they were made aware of his underworld connections and aware of the hitman contracted by a London firm, going through Danny's contacts one by one. Police would later find Danny's abandoned Escort RS Turbo. The police's missing person case of Danny Dyke was turned into a murder investigation pretty early on, which without a body, police solving these cases is extremely rare. Walesby worried, dug the decomposing body up and reburied it under a ton of concrete. He then made a large slab over the top and put the office caravan over it. Walesby was starting to fret over the police murder squad but one thing he wasn't expecting was the hitman from the London firm. He was going through Danny's drug contacts and any of the contacts not willing to talk to the hitman would be convinced within the first meeting. Word got back to Wellsby that there was a bullet with his name on it and he started to panic. And then word got through of a dealer he knew who had told the hitman from the London firm to do one you fool or he's going to get beat up. The hitman had taken the dealer's fingers and adjusted them with a flick of the wrist with a ring spanner. After hearing a new novel way of using a ring spanner, Walesby and Wilson went straight to the police and told them they was in danger and wanted protection and they would help them as much as they could. They made up a dealer who had last seen Danny. Walesby had heard the terrifying reputation of the London firm. He admitted he was himself in debt to them and was scared he was going to be abducted and made an example of. Wilson and Walesby were arrested and home searched while police were talking to a tradesman. He told the police of Wilson's new kitchen that he ripped out and replaced strangely with another new one exactly the same. The tradesman still had two old kitchen doors and his labourer kept the units because they was in such good condition. They were sent to forensics and revealed traces of blood. Wilson and Walesby were bailed and were looking at charges of dealing Class A and B product. (music) 
Walsby was becoming increasingly deranged and worried that the police were going to find the body. He started to worry about Wilson's increased drug taking and was worried he would cut a deal. Walsby needs to get rid of the body of Danny Dyke once and for all. He used a mini digger to dig down to the body, cleared the concrete and poured a barrel of red diesel into the pit. He chucked in pallet crates where the body was and set fire to it. After everything was burned away from the bones, he took away the remains and smashed them with a lump hammer into smaller pieces and threw them away in the rubbish. Everything then would go quiet. If the London firm's hitman did catch up with Wellsby, he must have done a good job in convincing him that he had nothing to do with the disappearance of Danny Dyke. The police's murder investigation was still ongoing. Danny Dyke's mum never gave up the search for her son, but things would grind to a halt with no info or leads. Two years later, the murder of Danny Dyke had gone cold. Police had a case built around Walsby's drug trafficking and dealing, and he was heading for court in the next few months. But what happened next shot murder squad detectives. Walsby had arranged a meeting with detectives. He wanted the trafficking and dealing case against him dropped. He also wanted £50,000. He said though he had nothing to do with the murder, he was able to tell them what happened to Danny Dyke and where he was buried. But he couldn't rat on the gang that killed him because he will end up dead. Police agreed and the drug case was dropped and police put him as a paid informant. He didn't get the £50,000 but received a payment of £3,000. In February 1996, two years after Danny Dyke went missing, police started excavating a snow-covered field that Walsby had disclosed. Police uncovered broken concrete pieces, pieces of carpet, a smashed screen from a Nokia phone. They also found small bone fragments that were taken away and analysed by police forensics and confirmed as human. After speaking to Danny's mom, they told her that the pieces of bone are found were human, but with no DNA match to any dental parts found, identification could not be confirmed. Danny's mom would put the case into another gear though, a creepy memento that Danny had kept before his death. Danny had kept cartilage in a jar after a knee operation. He kept it as a quirky souvenir. Frenzy detectives had got the match they needed. They then confirmed they recovered partial remains of Danny Dyke. A week after the identification of Danny Dyke's remains, to Walsby's shock and horror, he and Wilson were arrested for murder and remanded into custody. A year later in Swansea Crown Court, the court heard how Walsby and Wilson had murdered Danny Dyke over a drug debt. They did not want to pay back or couldn't pay back. But whatever happened, the three men fell out and Danny Dyke's life was taken. Both men blamed each other and said when each last saw Danny, he was badly beaten, but very much alive. They each said the other person murdered Danny and buried him in a rolled up carpet. On July 1997, John Walsby, who was 38 years old, was sentenced to life in prison. John Wilson, who was 39 years old, was also sentenced to life. John Wilson would die a few years later in prison. It wouldn't be the last we'd hear of John Walsby. He was released around 2018, and you guessed it, he went straight back into drug dealing. In May 2021, he was pulled over speeding in his Honda Civic with his wife in the passenger seat. Police searched his car and a bag of pills was found and £1,500 in cash, which he claimed was rent from one of his caravans. A search of his own found £70,000 worth of product and £8,000 in cash. Police found a list of names and next to the clients were ticks, whether it was Class A or Class B they needed. He described himself as a soldier and pleaded guilty to charges in concern 
to deal in Class A and B product. John Walesby, 62 years old, was sentenced to six years in prison. So there we have it, a crime story rolling all the way back to 1994. I myself think it's extremely doubtful we have heard the last of John Walesby. He's been in and out of prison since the 1970s. The murder of Danny Dyke is another name added to the list of people murdered in deals who have been double crossed or deals gone wrong. But dealing with someone like Wellsby, Danny never knew the vicious thug he was selling to. Giving Wellsby the product before payment led to his death. The saying, never a lender or a borrower be, has never been more true. <laughs> 